Okay. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Wednesdays at One Bible Study. We're so glad that you are here with us. And um, we are basically, I'm trying to get, trying to get me on the screen. Mute my, okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we are starting today, we're, we are, are on the advice of Don Beer, we are going to skip some of the boring details about how they made the tabernacle and all the pieces and details of the tabernacle. So if you are interested in that, um, then you can certainly read the last couple of chapters. But um, we're going to start today on chapter 31. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 31. This is where this is where the stuff gets good. Now we're past the details and everything. So everybody who's with me, um, welcome in. I'm Pastor Susan. This is from Advent Lutheran Church in Olathe, Kansas. And we are studying the book of Exodus. And we are starting today with 31. Basically, what I try to do is to read sections and then take any questions that we might have in the, in the Zoom meeting. Um, if you have questions and you're watching on, on YouTube or on Facebook, you're either going to need to uh, text me with that question, or um, you can type it in, this, in the box on Facebook. I won't get it in real time, though, so I'll, I'll have to get back to you with any answers or I can save them for next week. So if you have those uh, questions and you're watching on Facebook, you can just put your questions into the talk box and I'll pick it up at a later date. If you really want to do that next week, come in on the Zoom, and we always send the Zoom link out with the Wednesday uh, email blast, so you can do that. So you have all kinds of options to follow along with what we're doing. I'm checking to see if we're up on Facebook okay. So let's open up this, this afternoon with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, and we thank you so much for the witness of your word. Uh, the living word that we meet in a new relationship each time we come to this story, because each time we come with different experience and with different learnings and different uh, ways of seeing the stories that we have heard before or maybe that we're encountering for the first time. So be with us in this journey. Send your Holy Spirit to open up our eyes and our minds to new things uh, and new ways of seeing. And I pray, Lord, that each of these uh, disciples who are seeking you through your word would have lights go on and new understandings uh, be bestowed upon them as we study your word together. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, the revealer of God, Jesus Christ, the living word. We pray in his name. Amen. So, okay. So I did mention last week that in the Lutheran Study Bible, if you're using the Lutheran Study Bible, there were some great illustrations. I told you I would bring some, but um, the ones that are in the Study Bible are really the best. So um, there's a picture on page 162 of the Ark of the Covenant, which looks just like the one in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's probably where they got it. <laughs> but the Raiders of the Lost Ark research was pretty good on the kinds of things that they showed. So, um, so art imitates life, and we're so glad they do. Uh, then 164, at the top of 164, you have a really good sketch of the tabernacle. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple of, couple of notes about the tabernacle, that this was a, a, a movable feast, a movable worship space. And these, you know, they had stakes and posts like you would do for a tent. Um, and then they had, you know, the ropes that went down the sides. And then they had curtains that went along the ropes. Um, so everything could be rolled up and carried along with them as they were traveling in the desert. Um, the smaller box inside of that picture, if you're looking at it, it would be, have would be what would eventually become the Holy of Holies, the most uh, worshipful space. And that was where they thought that that's where God uh, came down to, you know, to be among the people. So uh, those are the kinds of pictures that I hope you have in your head as we as we move forward now. But this is the worship space that they would set up whenever they after they moved. The first thing they would do would be set up the tabernacle. And uh, at this point, 
and I think we're going to get a reference to that as we read today. The Levites, the tribe of the Levites, have been set apart. Um, they are not going to be the elder. They don't. They aren't included in the elders of the people um, because they are set apart to be the priests. So the whole tribe of Levi, of Levi, um, when they go into the promised land, will not be given land because they're supposed to distribute themselves around with the people. And um, so they will not have land, which is one of the underpinnings of the reason why the priests had to be cared for and fed uh, with the meat of the sacrifice and with the stuff that came into the temple because they had no land on which to support themselves. So they were supported by the, the grace of the people. Yes, Lloyd, I see that hand. In, 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 your, in the picture, what, what is the... Uh, first emblem uh, right inside the, the lower cloth the little, the little square? Yeah, it looks like a table. <laughs> okay, yeah. That would be that where they did the burnt offerings. So oh. that's where they would, and there's a, there's a, like a little bucket thing there. Um, right. The basin that would catch the blood and then they would throw it on the altar and that sort of thing. So the, the Holy of Holies is, is for prayer and worship of the priest. Uh, but the the outer area outside of the the box at the other end um, is the the t where they would do those offerings, the altar of the offerings and the sacrifice and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is the the setting of the Sabbath and the and the rationale for what happens and doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on that conversation because we might get into some. Um, interesting conversation about that. So I'm going to start reading at chapter 31. If you want to read along, go ahead. Or if you want to just sit back and listen and make notes um, as you want to make discussion or, or conversation. The Lord spoke to Moses. See, I have called by name Bez Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with divine spirit, with ability, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood in every kind of craft. Moreover, I have appointed with him Aholiab, son of Ahishamach of the tribe of Dan, and I have given skill to all the skillful, so that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat that is on it and all the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, the pure lamp stand with all its utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the basin with its stand and the finely worked vestments, the holy vestments for the priest Aaron and the vestments of his sons for their service as priests and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place. They shall do just as I have commanded you. The Lord said to Moses, you yourself are to speak to the Israelites. You shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, given in order that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the Israelites shall keep the Sabbath observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So uh, there you have some more descriptions. So basically Moses is gathering 
the crafts people who are going to, you know, do all of this work. And they've got all the instructions they need uh, in the previous chapters that we sort of skimmed over with all the detail and everything. But um, so that you can see how they had, they just, you know, they made everything. Think about our sanctuary, you know, and Lloyd made most of everything that's in there except the gold stuff. You know, <laughs> anything made out of wood, Lloyd did. So, uh, you know, we got that. And then, then think about all the stuff we use in worship. We use our communion ware, you know, we have a stand for the book. We have a Paschal candle. We have a cross. We have carts for, you know, to move things in. We have vestments. We have paraments those things change based on the year. Um, so we have carried on that tradition of um, honoring God with beautiful crafted um, pieces of art. And um, even though our sanctuary is not like one of the great sanctuaries of Europe, um, if any of you've traveled, you've seen those that are just, you know, amazing, artistic, wonderful things that have, um, that people have built to honor God and to bring glory to God and to basically to contribute their um, craft and their design and, and creative ability to the building of a house where people would gather to worship God. So um, that's, that's a tradition that has continued over the centuries. Okay, any questions about that? Any in just thoughts, comments? Don't forget to um, open up your mic if you wanna say anything here. You're absolutely transfixed, right? <laughs> what, what, what about putting people to death if they work? Okay, is, Pam, you're, is you're that breaking that up. Like, you, need to unquote, come, you need to come. Pam, you need to come closer to the microphone. You're breaking up. I'm closer. Does that make a difference? Um, a little bit, but not much. If you want to text that, me. Can you hear me now? Oh, I'll yeah. have to go to a different machine. I'll be back. Perfect. That's good. Okay, we'll come back to her when she gets finished with her different machine. Maybe what she was commenting on was the fact that you got put to death for working on the Sabbath day. Seems a little harsh. Yeah, could be, could be. I uh, just a little harsh. Um, and actually, what we're going to see in that um, is what happens um, after the after the tablets come down, you know, and we'll see a shift in the thinking because we've got basically. Um, to, wait a minute, let me let her in. Come on in. Um, two sets of, of kind of thinking about the rules. We got the liturgical thinking about the Ten Commandments that are going to come down with Moses off the mountain. And then we have this kind of a humanitarian document uh, that includes this idea of Sabbath. Because um, the, the creation story, as we've talked about before, sets up the idea of Sabbath for the, for the Jewish people and the temple worship and the priests and all of that kind of thing. But the idea of Sabbath had pre-existed, uh, much as we talked about Hammurabi's law had pre-existed that people had sort of, you know, some set of rules that were civilly for civil engagement and for uh, community um, relationships and enterprises. So there were some things that were already existing. This part um, was not that God created out of nothing rules that nobody had had rules until they got to the wilderness. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous to think that all those generations of people had lived without any kind of order. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that pre-existed, but we don't think about it as having pre-existed. So we had rules that were there. We had liturgical understanding. We had things that were just good for, um, for health which was that you would work for six days out of seven and on the seventh day you would rest. Um, so that was not, I mean, appointing it to the seventh day was, was a Hebrew um, construct, but the idea of working for so much time and then taking a day off as part of keeping yourself um, uh, productive and, and healthy. And especially when you get to the, the Ten Commandments, it's not only for humans 
that rest on the Sabbath, but it, the animals, the working animals also get a day off of working. Um, so part of that response, um, as far as if you don't do the Sabbath, you're going to die, um, is not so much a punitive thing as if you work all the time, you're going to die. Stop, you know, take a break. Okay. It's not good for you, uh, for your health and for your productivity to just be working all the time. So, so that's, that's part of that. There's a kind of a different set of distinctions there that they're making, um, on, in those two sets of things. So keep remembering here now, Moses is gone. He's up on top of Mount Sinai collecting the 10 commandments at this point. So there are no commandments, um, Jewish commandments that are at this point in in uh, in play right now. Okay, does that help, Pam? Is that is that the what you wanted to talk about the the death penalty for not keeping Sabbath? Yeah, and then the uh, what is it? The he shall be cut off from the people if he Give me the doesn't. Bird. Yeah, he should be cut off from the people. Whatever that is. Um, on fourteen. Whoever does any work on it shall be cut off from among the people. I don't know what that means. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, here again, this is an, kind of an ethnic code where we're talking about, you know, everybody has to play by the rules. Okay. And if you don't play by the rules, you get expelled or you're not part of the community. You know, part of what makes community is that people decide how they're going to live together. And I think, honestly, I, as I was reading this um, beforehand today, I was thinking this is one of the things why I think people are really um, affected by what some consider to be a threat to democracy, that Janu the, you know, the January 6th insurrection or protest or you know, whatever people are calling it. But the idea that something that is so bedrock to the American population as democracy, as living in a republic, um, can that that foundation can be shaken, um, and then people divided. I think people worry about the the fact that our democracy, our our the institution of our nation, what the you know the kind of things we've all all have accepted all along that made America the community that we like to think it has been. Um, when that gets questioned or when that gets shaken, then, you know, there's a division and people are very afraid of it and very angry that anybody would put at risk something as foundational as, uh, and I'm just, we're just, I'm just using that as an example, you know, it, different people have different depths of feeling about that as far as, you know, are we really putting democracy at risk or not? But what I'm what I'm trying to talk about is when when the rules that have always seemed to be to govern us, uh, whether they're written down rules or rules that we just have all sort of accepted to be part of a community, and then people start to um, flout the rules and not you know not pay any attention to the rules, and the, especially I mean think back to the prodigal son story. Somebody breaks the rules and doesn't get punished for it. There's going to be another son who's at home saying, "Wait a minute, <laughs> you know, I've been keeping the rules all my life, and here comes this son of yours, not my brother, but this son of yours, you know, who's gone off and done all this crazy stuff that I never got to do, and you welcome him home and you give him a big party. That's it's not fair." You know, so there's some of that going on and everything. And I think there's some of that going on here. This underpinning of, uh, of um, kind of a voluntary buying into how the community is going to work and who the community is going to be and what's the sign of the community. Uh, think about what we know about the Jewish people. You know, they have the sign of the community is their circumcision. OK, so they they, you know each Jewish man is marked so that he, everybody knows that he, well, not everybody, but one would assume that, that he's a member of the community because he's gone through the circumcision ritual. You know, they're part of the community because they have dietary laws and they, and they have um, religious laws and they keep certain things. Some people are more, you know, 
interested in the letter of the law than they are in the spirit of the law. You know, and so you've got, you know, as it always has been, there are some people who are more um, concerned about the minutia and some people who are more concerned about the big picture. So I think a lot of that comes here. And I don't see, um, you know, even though it, we're talking about this is a conversation that God and Moses are having at Mount Sinai and, and God is saying this, I think scholars would refute that that was practiced that someone who broke the Sabbath was executed. Um, but it certainly got Jesus into trouble when he, you know, when he did things that people didn't think were appropriate on the Sabbath. And, um, you know, at that point they, they said, we don't have a law to put a man to death, but they certainly stoned people, you know, and sometimes those people died. So, you know, they had, there's different interpretations going on here. I don't know I, that I know that doesn't answer your question, yes or no, but I never do that, do I? <laughs> I try to, that's where I try to channel my inner rabbi. It's like, don't ever answer the question. <laughs> just, just put them in a place where they have to think about the question a little more deeply. Okay. Anything else about that? And got the, so Moses is eventually going to come down with the tablets and then we're going to talk about them. But, um, well, this is a great segue, actually, from what I was just talking about. Any Anything else that you wanted to talk about as far as the Sabbath? Oh, I, I did want to say that the placement of the Sabbath day originally was the last day of the week. Okay. And that was influenced by the reading of the story of creation, where God created on six days. And on the seventh day, the final day of the week, God rested. Okay. So that was the Hebrew um, understanding and Jews to this day, Saturday is their Sabbath. It's a Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. Okay. Over the centuries, um, people had, had moved it and early as probably as early as the second century, Christians had chosen to mark their day of rest or their day of worship as the first day of the week, because that's the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. So they moved it away from the Jewish Sabbath, first of all, to delineate themselves. Um, you know, but at this point, they've, they've been tossed out of the synagogue or have left willingly, but the synagogue and the church have, have started, you know, to be two separate things. So the Christian community chose to no longer sell it. I mean, I think some of them, the, the Christ-believing Jews, continued to, to celebrate the Jewish Sabbath, and then the Christian day of rest or day of resurrection. So the whole weekend was, was religiously held. Um, I don't know how long that particular period lasted, but once people really began to identify as Christians in Christian communities, um, the idea of the Saturday Sabbath as a day of rest started to, to wane and the Christian community moved forward and, and obviously have always used Sunday as our, as our Sabbath day. Um, there was something else in a commentary I wanted to share with you. Oh, it was Constantine uh, in the in 321 um, who basically codified that Sunday was Sabbath uh, for the Christian because he had just recently become Christian himself and declared the Roman Empire a Christian empire. Uh, and then at that time, he was the one who basically said the Sabbath is now to be celebrated on Sunday rather than on Saturday. So it goes all the way back to the 300s. Uh, you know, and that's the time when the creeds were being established and all that, you know, everything about the Christian church was being decided by these councils. And, uh, and then uh, Constantine did kind of, you know, put the emperor's emperor mater on there to make sure that that happened. And everybody saw it the same way. So anything, comments, questions? Amazements, lights, darkness. <laughs> okay, uh, chapter thirty-two. This is where this is where it gets good. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron, remember his brother, and said to him, "Come, make gods for us, for who shall go before us 
As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain, carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and on the back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved upon the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound made by victors or the sound made by losers. It is the sound of revelers that I hear. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. Moses said to Aaron, why did this people do to you that you have brought, what did the people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are bent on evil. They said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Whoever has gold, take it off. And so they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. When Moses saw that the people were running wild, or Aaron had let them run wild to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you. Go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill your brother, your friend, and your neighbor. The sons of Levi did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 of the people fell on that day. Moses said, Today you have ordained yourself for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of a son or a brother, and so have brought a blessing on yourselves this day. 
On the next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. And now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. See, my angel shall go in front of you. Nevertheless, when the day comes for punishment, I will punish them for their sins. Then the Lord sent a, pla a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Okay. That was a really nice story about our loving God, huh? <laughs> So how do you make how do you make sense of this? What I don't understand is they've been following a pillar of fire. I mean, they're visual evidence of God working in their lives. He sent the manna to save their lives. And then Moses disappears for a few days and they're like, let's do something different. Yeah. I'm tired of this church. Let's go to a different church. <laughs> no, that's true. And, you know, and it's like, wouldn't you think, like you say, I mean, they've had God present with them all this time in miraculous ways. I mean, he brought them out of slavery, you know, through the Red Sea parted that they walked across the Red Sea on dry land. Number one, you know, they go into the desert, they get clear water, they get food, they get pillar of fire and cloud and, you know, all of this stuff. And then Moses goes up, you know, to confer with God. And instead of being happy for Moses, you know, like how cool is this that our leader spends time in Moses goes to his study, you know, to confer with God, to pray, to worship, to commune with with God as their leader. And I mean, I would think that's what they were expecting of him. Um, and yet they get, like you say, you know, it's like they get bored, they get tired. Um, you know, there's, they don't like the games that Aaron had planned or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you know, you really, you get to this thing where God says, you know, the people are stiff necked, you know, it's like, they're just, they, as human beings always do. And here, actually, the commentary I've been reading on this is, um, talks about the, the, the making of the golden calf um, is part of some legends of other, other traditions as well. But one of the things that I thought was totally intriguing, um, hang on a sec. Um, who is, who's the guilty party here? Is, is it, you know, was Moses just having such a great time up on the mountain hanging with God, you know, that he just said, I, I can't, I just can't go down there with those people, you know? And so he delayed and delayed and delayed, you know, so maybe he's the problem. The other one that I had not, um, I didn't have a chance to check this, the identification of the guilty party as the, and the quote is the mixed multitude that's talked about in Exodus 12, 38, who accompanied Israel out of Egypt along with Egyptian magicians, Janos and Yambros. And there's a, a designation here from a, um, from a Quran, from the Quran. So that in the Quran, as the story is told, um, there are these two Egyptian magicians who are accompanying the people of Israel as, as well as some mixed Multitude. So there were other people who escaped with them, apparently, according to the Quran. Um, so, you know, we don't, I don't think we see it. Wait a minute, let me just, let me go back real quick to that. Well, go ahead. What about Aaron? I mean, he asks for the gold, he makes a mold, <laughs> he forms the calf. And then when Moses shows up, he says, Well, I, you know, I just took this gold and threw it in the fire and out came a calf. Came I don't calf. know how that happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I, you know, I think you can, you can justify poor Aaron, you know, he's left alone with, you know, maybe a couple of sidekicks and Moses and Joshua have gone up the mountain. And so he's hanging out there by himself and the whole throng of people are like, we want a calf, we want, you know, and I can imagine that he was a little nervous um, about not making it out of this part of the desert alive um, and went along with it. But yeah, that's a great, the great image when he tells the story, you know, he just threw the, the gold into the fire and a calf came out, you know, like, wasn't it Michelangelo who looked at the block of marble and said he was trying to see David inside. And then he, you know, he had to find David inside the block of marble. And then he just took away the pieces that weren't part of the David statue, you know, so, <laughs> you know, artists. They're so weird, you know, <laughs> those artistic people. Um, I'm and looking. I found, I found that the they had a mold to mold the calf. And yeah. Interesting. You yeah. Know, did, did they make it or did the they have to build? They had to build it, right? Can't do it without a mold. Formed it in a mold. Yeah. Oh, or I have a note in my, um, a, an alternate reading of the Hebrew there would be, or fashioned it with a graving tool. Oh, okay. So if you like that one better, you can have that I one. Do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> but um, if you want to flip back just for fun to 12, Exodus 12, 38. And I flew right over this when I read this. Um, when we were cooking along, because usually if I'm going to make a comment on something, I'll underline or circle. And I didn't have any notation on this. Um, the Israelites journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides the children. A mixed crowd also went up with them and livestock in great numbers. So from Ramses to Sukkoth, and so one of the first legs of their journey, uh, they picked up other people who were traveling with them, which makes sense um, when there are these, like we just something I read said something about their enemies. I'm thinking, well, where are the enemies come from? You know, who are they, who are these enemies that they're dealing with? But apparently they're with them. And then remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, where are they getting the animals to sacrifice when they, when they, you know, when they, um, commit, you know, commemorated the, what am I trying to say? The tabernacle, uh, you know, consecrated the tabernacle. They, you know, they had, you know, oxen and all kinds of flock animals to, you know, I'm thinking, why didn't they just eat them earlier when they got really hungry? What, why depend on manna, you know? Um, so apparently this has happened and I, and, and I didn't pay any attention to it. So they've been picking up people and, and flocks and, you know, grazing animals and stuff to take with them on their journey, why they wouldn't just wait till they got to Jericho and buy the stuff there before they went into the promised land. <laughs> but, the, you know, what, I don't know. Anyway, the other thing from the Quran was um, the action of Aaron in making the calf also requires explanation. His action may have arisen from fear and that uh, they're noting that from Philo, who was an early historian, perhaps was intensified from the murder of her, which is not is not noted here, but it says, and that's from a uh, Rabbi Leviticus ten three. So in the the rabbinical scrolls from Leviticus, we have some kind of explanation of the murder of her, which I we don't have in the Bible. I don't think. He may not even have, or Aaron may not even have fashioned the calf, according to, uh, here's a notation from the Quran. This is also the conclusion of the, oh, no, I'm sorry, that's from the San, a Sanhedrin document. This is also the conclusion of the Quran, where Aaron does not build the golden calf. Instead, a person named Samiri builds the calf, while Aaron warns the people not to worship it. So this is a really good example, though, of you know, some of these ancient documents, we just, we, I, I mean, I do, I know I do or did until you really start to study these stories. You think, you know, okay, God caused this to be written and there was nothing that happened before this until this was written. And then this is the beginning of how this stuff started. But there's so much other, there were, you know, 
tens of thousands, maybe millions of ancient peoples living in these lands um, who who had their own stuff going on, whether they had their own stories of their gods. I mean, we talk about the Gilgamesh epic, uh, which is a very ancient poem that talks about the dome and the, the way they perceived the earth and the heavens being laid out. Um, so there are all kinds of ancient, ancient texts and manuscripts that inform our stories that we have in scripture. And one of the, um, for those of you who recall the Seminex days um, when the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, their seminary in St. Louis, there were um, most of the professors and the students were starting to hook into this new thing called biblical historical criticism, which was an apparatus to interpret the Bible by using things from outside the Bible itself. So another ancient manuscript that talks about this, this story in a different way. And so what they wanted to do was to be able to access this, um, this information from other, you know, archaeological digs were coming up with different scrolls, the, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls had just been started, they had started to, to um, look at those. And um, so about the time of the early late 60s, early 70s, there was a real push in the seminary in St. Louis to allow um, the, the professors to teach that there was this other documentation that informed what we have as scripture. And the hierarchy of the seminary was like, no, 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 scripture interprets itself. You know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know, so all you need is the Bible and you get everything you need to know from the Bible. And the professors and the students said, no, <laughs> we, don't, we don't think that. So they walked out. They left the campus. They went over to Eden Theological Seminary, which was not too far away, and continued doing their classes with the professors and the students from, from um, Concordia Seminary. They became what we call seminary in exile. And um, Jerry Mansholt, who was the bishop a couple of times ago, was a student at at the seminary when that was going on, um, as, as were a couple of the gentlemen who served pastorates in, in the Central State Synod that, you know, to listen to them talk about this is a formative thing in their lives, because they had to decide where they're going to go with, you know, what the, the party line was, or where they would go, go with this new exciting way to be informed and to study and to think about things. Um, and they eventually broke away and they called it Seminary in Exile or Seminex. And that was the root of the, the Missouri Synod folks who were more progressive, not well, less, not as conservative as the base, um, moving into what they called the AELC, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches, which eventually then merged with the ALC and the LCA to form the ELCA. So um, in our roots as ELCA, we have always been more moderate than conservative. Um, and so, you know, that's, this is one of the issues that came up, but it's so cool, I think, to, to be able to see in commentaries. And if you have a Bible, not the Lutheran study Bible doesn't do a lot of um, sourcing, but I have a couple of different Bibles that do a lot of footnotes and sourcing of other documents that are informing the story. Um, so it's just kind of cool to move into that's a whole nother level of of study and research. Um, but I, I, you know, I think I find it really fascinating. So Lloyd, wake up. <laughs> You're still, he's resting his eyes. OK, I'm moving on. I'm moving on now. All right. So anything else about that? The the calf, the questions about the calf. But, you know, really, the bottom line here is the people, you know, they want to be. People don't want God. People want to be God. <laughs> and that's just kind of the, the fatal flaw in humanity is that we just can't get over our big bad selves. You know, we really, we, we want to believe in God, but we really would rather prefer to believe that we know better than God, especially where we're concerned. Um, and that's where all the original sin conversations end up, you know, that it's our own human pride that we think that we know better than God what's good for us. Um, 
and here it is again, you know, we've, we've, you know, Moses has gone up to commune with God and we are too impatient to wait till he returns, you know, and if something bad had happened to Moses on top of the mountain, don't you think God would have either let them know or sent Joshua to tell them, oops, you know, Moses fell off the mountain and he's not coming back. So I'm your new leader. Let's go to the promised land. You know, who you know how they would do that. Okay. Comments, questions. Okay. I want to see if we can, I can get through 33. Um, so this is now the command to leave Sinai. The Lord said to Moses, go leave this place, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. And <laughs> I love this. You and the people you have brought up from the land of Egypt, not the calf. And go to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, or I would consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard these harsh words, they mourned, and no one put on ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do to you. Therefore, the Israelites stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand, each of them at the entrance of their tents, and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise and bow down, all of them, at the entrance of their tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then he would return to the camp, but his young assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, see, you have said to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight, now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, so my first question is, how can you see speak to God face to face when he says you can't see my face? <laughs> and then he says, I'll cover your face and I'll protect you from looking at my goodness. But apparently, you know, of an evening, Moses would go out to the tent and you know, God would come down in the, 
I, I always pronounce this wrong. It's either Shekinah or Shekinah, um, the, you know, the pillar of fire that God was, um, was with them. So that was, you know, that was still around with them. Yes, Lloyd. It's kind of like the confessional booth. Kind of like the confessional booth. Yeah, the cleft of the rock. I like that. And then, you know, we get that famous, you know, rock of ages cleft for me hide me, you know, from you, basically from your glory uh, for, you know, this is a, a lovely juxtaposition to the conversation with God and Moses about the people. And then this conversation between God and Moses about Moses and, you know, and his faithfulness and his worthiness and willingness to, uh, to do everything that God has asked of him. Um, but, but still has this you know, kind of like Abraham had, he'll go toe to toe with God, which I, I really like, you know, um, that he's like, no, don't, you know, don't consume them. The Egyptians, it'll give the Egyptians a bad idea. It's like, so what? Who cares? <laughs> you know, but please, God, don't consume them. Don't let your anger consume them because that'll look bad to the Egyptians. And then, you know, he says, don't, leave, don't stay here in the desert and tell us to go on you know, how will people know who we are, you know, if you're not with us? So, you know, that, that whole idea that God is traveling and dwelling with them uh, begins to take shape here because before um, you don't have really any stories, even in the patriarch stories, God visits them. You know, God visits Abraham and tells tells him that Sarah is going to have a baby and, you know, Sarah laughs. God visits Jacob and wrestles with him. You know, all these stories have God coming either as a, other humans or as angels or as visions or whatever, but God doesn't dwell with them. God isn't with them until the wilderness when they build the tabernacle. And then he's going to be with them, you know, through throughout the rest of the movement into the promised land and up through the building of the temple. And, and, uh, you know, and then with Jesus, you know, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And then God, you know, Jesus sends the advocate so that we always have God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. So we've never lived through that time where God just dropped in every once in a while and <laughs> said, Hey, what's for dinner? You know, <laughs> I have a plan for you. Let me tell you my plan for your life kind of thing. So what about this? Anything that you noticed? Questions? I have either been completely bored you to death or you are so amazed by what you have learned today, it's like, wow. <laughs> and it is 154. Ah, I got it. Okay, so next time um, we're going to talk about the, there's going to be a new set of tab tablets for the law, and then the covenant's going to be renewed. We're going to talk about a little bit of some regulations, but I will take Don's advice and skip over all the details. <laughs> Thanks for that. I appreciate that. You know, sometimes I get reading and I'm thinking, God, this is really boring, you know. <laughs> and then Don says, you know, you don't have to read all of it. <laughs> so I will, there are a couple of uh, things. If you want to kind of scan through the next couple of chapters, because we do have uh, the making of, again, some, some descriptions of things that they make, the Ark of the Covenant, the Court of the Tabernacle. Um, a lot of this now we're, we're getting another we're getting a parallel strand here so um and i don't know if it's really clear let me look ahead because here we're calling god lord oftentimes when there's a parallel strand that the name of the lord will be something you know we'll start calling him lord god instead of just lord which is a different hebrew word but it's just it's like details so we don't get the name of God, but I will, so we're, I'm going to do some kind of skipping stepping stones uh, through this next duplicate strands. So we don't have to read through a, a lot of that stuff and move the story ahead. And basically we probably next week, we will probably finish Exodus. Um, and then I we're lucky you, we are definitely going to skip Leviticus. <laughs> uh, 
unless you feel like you want to you you know you want to put on your hip boots and and walk through there but it is not necessarily it's all about clean and unclean and and purity codes and that kind of stuff um there's some issues that come out of there but that is something maybe you're you know, your side work could be to just read through Leviticus and make, you know, jot yourself some notes about why did they do this and why did they do that? But it's all about the purity. Um, what I'm thinking, though, is that we might skip over and do a little bit of reading in numbers. Once we get past the census of the numbers of the tribes, um, which is, you thought the description of making the tabernacle is boring. Hey, <laughs> this is like an endless genealogy that you do not want to have to read through. Um, but then you get into a little bit more. Uh, it, we, we can probably dump into numbers mm, probably around seven. Um, that would give us kind of pick up, you know, where we left off at the end of Exodus, because Exodus is really just the story of the way out. It's not the way back in. So we, get, we pick up a little bit of narrative from Numbers, and then we'll skip over to Joshua that really picks up the story and gets them into the promised land. So that's my plan. If anybody's got thoughts or concerns about that plan, just keep them to yourself. <laughs> no. Susan? Yes, Lloyd, I see that hand. Susan? Yes. Uh, where is this the place where Aaron and... Um, his sister get in trouble, and and then they get uh, his sister gets sent out of the out from away that from the people, and and she gets. I think some kind of a, that might be in numbers. I'm trying. I can't remember where that is. Oh, um, okay. It's I, I it's probably in numbers. I don't think it's in Joshua. So, okay. but we'll we'll make a note of it when we have you got hidden knowledge about that that you'd like to share <laughs> well, i just kind of like that story oh okay i'll, I'll make sure <laughs> that i know when it's coming so we can so we can be ready for it um pam did you have i saw that hand no comment oh okay all righty my gosh somebody fell over melissa are you okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so i will see you guys uh don't forget hold an evening prayer tonight at seven and then if in, any of you are going to do the cast book, um, that's tomorrow night at seven. And both, the, actually, the if you didn't get, I think I already sent out to the book study group for, who did Waking Up White, the the Zoom address, but it's also in the, the email that you got today. So if you want to do the cast group, and even if you haven't read the book, you know, I haven't read it all. So I mean, even if you don't have it, it you might come and listen for a little bit. Um, and see if it's something to your taste. But I think it's a good, I think for those who did uh, Waking Up White, um, I think it's a really good next step. Um, some of it's pretty hard, but I think I think we can do it. <laughs> so anyway, okay. So God bless, have a good rest of the day. Get outside if you can. It seems to be beautiful outside my window. Mm -hmm. Okay. Outside okay. is good. <laughs> Thanks for being with us.